I'm an insectologist from CSIRO in Canberra. Um, a lot of the research that I'm involved in is uh, really around understanding the ecology and biology of invertebrate pests and beneficials in mixed grain production landscapes. I'm going to turn on the side, sorry, I turned it off. It's a trick on the air, Sorry. Okay, so I'm really interested in the research that I'm involved in is really around to understand how we can reduce the risk of pest outbreaks occurring. And the reason why I'm interested in uh, and why I focus on that area of research is that once you reach thresholds with insects pests, you actually have very few options. You can either spray or you cannot spray. Your decisions actually become uh, relatively small in that context. There might be some discussion around which product you're going to do, use or whatever, but essentially once you're over threshold, you can either spray or not spray. So I'm quite interested in what some of the factors are that actually might impact your risk of pest outbreaks occurring at all and how we can actually um, manage both the fields and the landscapes to reduce the risk of pest outbreak and actually keep pests below that threshold. So there's a number of factors that impact your risk of pest outbreaks occurring. There's a number of management decisions that get made within a field that can impact both pests and beneficials. In this picture here, uh, different types of stubble management practices, but also insecticide use patterns. There's also a whole series of factors outside the field that can impact your risk of pest outbreaks occurring within that field. Uh, whereabouts the source areas of pests are in your farm, um, whereabouts the non-crop vegetation is and whether or not you've got any weeds that host those pest species, especially over the summer period. So we know that there's a whole range of <coughs> invertebrates that are really good at suppressing pest populations in fields and this slide just illustrates the diversity of beneficial insects that you might have in your field right now. Uh, this just shows you the different types of beneficials that attack aphids. You can see we've got things like lacewings here. Uh, we've got um, maggots of hoverflies, are really good predators. There's a whole range of predatory beetles, and the photo there is of a damsel bug. There's a huge number of predatory spiders. Wolf spiders in particular will be out and about in your fields right now. Also, later in the season, both uh, lady beetles, adults, and immatures are both predatory. On top of that, you've got a whole series of parasitic wasps. And these little wasps actually lay their eggs inside the host. And the immature wasp develops within the host, eventually catching out and killing the pest. So a huge diversity of beneficial invertebrates that are present within your field and actually just need a little bit of care to make sure that they're there and active when you need them to be. So today I'd like to touch on a few emergence pest issues because they're probably the issues that you're facing right now. I'm just going to touch on red-legged earth mites, loosen flea and also cut worms. And emergence pest issues are tricky for a number of reasons, but the two that I think are, are most problematic is firstly that they cause direct feeding damage to a whole range of different crops. So they cause yield loss, they have the potential to cause yield loss in itself. But also the management decisions that you make about how you're going to actually deal with those outbreaks of those emergence pests impact your late season risk associated with other pests. They do that through two ways. Firstly, impacting the beneficial populations within your field and the build-up of those populations across time and also through um, interactions between different pest species, which I'll touch on in a sec. A lot of the stuff I'm going to present here today comes from the iSpy manual. Uh, this is just a, a, a big folder that lists a whole range of different identification guides and information around pests and beneficials. <coughs> You can actually download this for free, a chapters of this thing for free from the GRDC website, um, the top URL there. There's also another area you can get a whole lot of really good information is the IPAM, for, for IPAM Guidelines for Grains website, which is at the bottom there. Um, so both those sources I really recommend you go and have a look through and see if you can find it. A lot of the information that I present here today are, are present on those websites. So red-legged earth mite. Um, most of you should be familiar with this species, but in case you're not, it's a, a very small uh, mite pest, only about 0.2 millimetres long, black with red legs. Uh, it sometimes can be pretty difficult to see in crop fields, and usually what you'll see first is the damage. So the damage that it causes is called silvering. Um, on the tops of leaves, it's pretty obvious at most stages. Um, if you go out and look for this species, the best time to look for it is a sunny day, um, sort of in the middle of the day when it's nice and sunny and warm. So they usually sit on the underside of the leaf, but then when the start, sun starts to come out, they'll move on to the top side of the leaf and start feeding and cause this silvering damage. So they're grouped together in groups of about 30 sometimes. Uh, they call the silvering damage. I think what, what's one of the most scary aspects of this particular pest is that in WA we've seen resistance to both synthetic pyrethroids and organophosphates in certain populations of red-legged earth mite. 
So although re resistance is not a widespread issue, we can see that there is resistant populations out there um, and you should be watching out for that. So this is the life cycle of the red-legged earth mite. We're sitting about here now. Um, what's happened over, over summer is that this species can produce these really resistant oversummering diapausing eggs that have sat around in the topsoil surface and in the trash throughout that summer period and are really good at um, avoiding drying out and you know not being killed during really hot summer conditions. We've done a bit of work trying to understand what are some of the environmental triggers that cause those diapausing eggs to hatch and lead to the populations of mites that you're now seeing in your fields right now. And this work was done mainly by Gary McDonald at the University of Melbourne. And what they found is that the autumn oversummering eggs hatch when the daily temperatures fall between 16 to 20 degrees and there's a rainfall event of about five millimetres. So it's a cool species, it likes the weather cold. As the temperatures start to drop below that 20 degree period for a number of consecutive days and you have a rainfall event, those eggs are going to start to hatch and the insects will um, start to look for food to eat. Often what will happen is they'll hatch on weedy areas outside your field. So you might have had really good weed control within the field, but there might be some patches of weeds around the borders of your fields. And that's often where these eggs will hatch and the immatures will start feeding. From there, they start to move into the crop field. And you can see right about now is when you start, should be monitoring your fields to see if you can see these insects in your crop field. What happens then is that throughout the season they're going to go through uh, about three generations in your crop fields. Probably only these first couple of generations that are going to cause problems because once the crop gets up and away they're not, they're not much of a problem anymore. But for other, crop, for other pasture fields in particular you want to be watching about when um, they start to go into these final generations. So what happens is in this final generation as the weather starts to get warmer the female sort of can detect that and they start to say, hey, I want to be able to produce these diapausing oversummering eggs. So they produce different eggs at that point in time that are far more resistant to insecticide sprays. Here's just another example of the life cycle. This comes from the Queensland um, DPI and also CETA. Um, what you want to be looking out for is here. So this is what I'm talking about. Late in the summer season, you might have a pasture system where you'll have these oversummering eggs being laid. And what's really important here is that you want to optimise the spray timing in some of these pastures to make sure you catch those adults before they start producing those diapausing eggs. Once they produce those diapausing eggs, you've got very little chance of being able to kill those eggs using the insecticide spray. So when you're thinking about management, you really want to target your sprays to make sure that you're getting the stages of the life cycle that are most vulnerable to those insecticides. Uh, if we come back to canola now, there's been a bit of work done on thresholds with red-legged earth mite, again from the University of Queensland. The new canola that we've got suggests that at about 10 mites per plant, just at the late cotyledon to first true leaf stage, is, is quite a good threshold to start to think about how you're going to control those pests. But anything less than that, um, probably you're not going to see any economic damage. If you do get to this stage and you are thinking about spraying, you want to target the mites before they um, reach adulthood and lay any sort of winter eggs. You should also consider border sprays too. So often these uh, species don't move very far and they will move from the outside of the field in. So you might actually consider a border spray just to catch that population around the edge and reduce its density. And that might be enough to actually allow the crop to get up and going and pass that vulnerable stage. Later in the season, um, you want to be thinking about where those weeds are and how, how they might be acting as an oversummering bridge for that particular species. Cape weed in particular is a really good oversummering uh, weed host. I mean, they love cape weed all year round, but especially at that time of year, it's a, it's a really good host. Also thinking about less preferred, preferred crop plants. So things like chickpea is a less preferred host if you've got a, a problem paddock to deal with. Just moving on now to talk about loosened flea. This is another emergence pest that you might see out and about now. Um, it's actually not a flea at all. It's a springtail or a calembola. It has this little thing under its abdomen called a gercula. And sometimes if there's a lot of them in a paddock or a pasture, when you walk through the pasture, they'll sort of jump around. So that's why they're called a, a springtail. They're globular in, in shape. They're quite pretty little insect. Uh, they've got segmented antennae. The adults can be quite large, up to three millimetres. I know that doesn't seem big, but you will notice them um, in the adult stage. Like the mites, what you will probably notice first is the damage, and they cause these pretty distinctive, what's called windowing in leaves, um, where they just sort of rasp at the top part of the leaf um, and leave these little windows between the different veins. 
they mainly occur as adults um, from autumn through to spring. So again, like red-legged earth mite, they're, they're a cool species. They really like cold weather. What's interesting about this species, or I think, I suppose, what makes them problematic for management is that most synthetic pyrethroid chemicals are, are fairly ineffective against this species. So they have what's called a high degree of natural tolerance to synthetic pyrethroids. They're not resistant, but they can just withstand really high doses and it doesn't seem to knock them about that much. Um, and what we found in um, some work that we've been doing is that, and also anecdotally in the field a lot, is that it's very easy to induce secondary pest outbreaks with some of the early, early season SP sprays. So often what will happen is people will put on an early season SP spray, maybe for red-legged earth mites. Um, the loosened flea, which is more tolerant to that, doesn't get knocked around anywhere near as much. They have much more food because you kill all the mites, so there's no competition with the other pest species. You've also damaged a lot of the beneficial populations that would be attacking this particular loosened flea. And what that means is that loosened flea numbers can jump pretty rapidly within fields. So you're actually um, causing an outbreak, increasing your risk of outbreak associated with this pest by using some of those products early in the season. What we found in, uh, I suppose, trial studies, uh, both around New South Wales, South Australia, and into WA, is that when you've got canola um, and you've got, we looked at all of the different insecticide inputs that go onto both canola and wheat over a number of years, and we found that in low pest pressure years, um, seed dressings in canola actually did provide quite a good yield benefit. It was a small but significant yield benefit, but none of the foliar sprays, especially the early season foliar sprays, provided any real yield benefit. And in wheat, we found both the seed dressings and the foliar sprays, none of them really provided a yield benefit. Uh, and we think mainly that some of those early season sprays do knock around the beneficials quite a bit, and they also cause some of these secondary pest outbreaks as well, or have the potential to increase your risk of secondary pest outbreaks. So here's just the life cycle of the loosened flea. Um, there is a bit of a threshold for loosened flea, but it's more of a rule of thumb than a sort of an empirically derived threshold. So don't, don't just ru rush out the spray, do have a look at what's going on within the field. Uh, it's about 10 holes per leaf or about 50% leaf damage, which is not necessarily the easiest threshold to translate into sort of an action. If you do decide to spray and you do decide that you've got really high numbers, um, you want to spray about three weeks after the eggs start to hatch here. And that's so that you can get these guys before they reach maturity and they're, they're more vulnerable to insecticide at that point in time. Again, late in the season, if you want to think about where some of those over-summer and weed hosts are present within your farm, especially those that are nearby to crop fields. And cape weed, again, is another really good um, host to this species. Also, some of the pastures, um, thinking about the clover varieties that you've got in there and um, how good those pastures are at supporting that loose and fleet across that summer period and providing a source for your crops in the next year. And finally, cutworms now. Um, cutworms aren't really an emergence pest, but I know there's been some issues with cutworms here over a couple of years, so I thought I'd include them in this talk. Cutworms are actually not just one species. We're talking about a number of agrostis species and other species. The bogong moth in Canberra is probably the most, um, the, the one that springs to mind when you're thinking about um, cutworms. But there's a number of different species. And because there's a number of different species, they each have different life cycles. So their life cycles can range from three months up to one year. And so that makes it quite confusing when we're talking about cutworms as, as a whole, because they can have very different life cycles. And a lot of them, we don't really understand their life cycles either. They're pretty obvious when you see them in the fields, especially the adults. The adult caterpillars can be 40 to 50 millimetres long, so big caterpillars. And they have a really smooth and greasy appearance. That sounds weird and it doesn't really come out very well on photos, but when you see one and put it in your hand, it will look, um, it will look greasy. They can be differentiated from other caterpillars pretty easily in that the Heliothus and some of the other caterpillars like the army worm have lots of lines along their body, whereas cutworms don't really have any lines. They're smooth and greasy. And they also don't have any hairs. The larvae feed at night, but they're actually pretty easy to find during the day. You just got to go out and dig around the soil, the base of plants a bit, and you'll find them pretty easily. Um, and they coil into a ball when you disturb them. Whereas things like diamondback moth or heliotis will thrash around a bit when you try to pick them up. Uh, I suppose they do the most damage or, or cause the most yield loss when they start to chew through the stems of emerging seedlings and actually um, lock plants off occasionally. Here's the life cycle of the cutworms. I suppose what's different about cutworms compared to the other two species that I just spoke about is that the eggs of this particular species need to be laid, laid on green plant material. So the, as, as with all caterpillars, really the, the moth tries to find a green plant to overposit on to lay their eggs, 
as that egg hatches, the larvae then feeds directly on the plant that the egg was laid. So the adult moth is actually looking around in the landscape, trying to find a plant that's really good to lay its eggs on so its baby's got something to eat. It's not going to lay its egg just anywhere, it's going to look for a really good host plant that it can lay its eggs so that it knows that its baby's got a good chance of actually surviving. So what that means is that oversummering weeds are really critical for the continuation of the life cycle of that species in the landscape. Often what happens is that you have adult moths that might be um, in inland Australia, somewhere very far away on, on host plants. They migrate into a region um, and they're looking for host plants to lay eggs on. If they find a host plant either in a crop field or maybe in a weed patch nearby a crop field, they'll lay their eggs and the larvae will hatch. The larvae won't move terribly far because they, they really do like to stay on plants. Imagine if they, they, they've got a lot of risks if they move off that plant. In a lot of ways they can die if they shift off that plant. So they'll obviously shift off the plant if they eat it and if they have to move. But if they don't have to move and they can consume the whole plant, they usually don't move too far. So the adults are highly mobile, but the larvae are, are less mobile. So um, I suppose as with all Lepidopterans, the optimal time to spray is when you've got small larvae. So the bigger the larvae get, the harder they are to kill using an insecticide spray. There's a number of, again, thresholds that are more sort of rules of thumb, but in cereals we're talking about two or more larvae, 0.5 metres of row. I think that is another one. And another one of about three larvae per metre squared as well. So that's about the time when you're thinking, oh, this, this might be causing a problem. You want to spray the youngest larvae you can, so when they're the smallest. If you can, you want to spray in the evening. So these are nocturnal species, they're more likely to be feeding at night. So if you spray in the evening, um, your insecticides are going to be breaking down as quick and you're more likely to get contact between the larvae and the insecticide. Again, I'm thinking about, they often cause what's called ball patch in the field, where you've got like a, an area where, of the field where the, the plants have been locked off. And you can consider spot sprays for this. You don't have to spray the whole field. And the reason for that is if you spray the whole field, you've got a better chance of actually killing a lot more beneficials than spot spraying just the area that's affected. So what can I do now to reduce my risk of pest outbreaks? First of all, you can be out there monitoring. It's, it's really important at this time of year, I know it's a busy time, but to be looking at those emerging crops, looking for damage, um, turning over leaves to make sure you're getting anything that's underneath the leaf, um, and then trying to identify the different stages of the crop pests. If you're unsure about a crop pest and there's always new crop pests coming up all the time, um, make sure you get a confirmation of the ID. Um, there's a pest fact service that's run out of Caesar. Um, there's the website there. It's a really good pest alert service, so it can alert you to what other things are going on uh, in your region. They also run a diagnostic service, so you can actually send samples to them to get confirmation of ID. Also, photos are really good. You can usually tell pretty quickly at least what group something is from a photo. So make sure you confirm your identity. There is a big difference between which insecticide products you want to use for different pest species. They're not all the same. Even though the broad spectrums will kill a lot of stuff, there are other options that you might want to consider as well. And even within the broad spectrums, there are uh, there is some variation in terms of, as I've shown you with the loose and flea, there's tolerance to certain groups. If you do decide to spray, really do consider the spot sprays or the border sprays. Like, again, this is a really about conserving your beneficials and the low populations of beneficials that you have got in your field so they're present when your diamondback moth and your heliopolis and your aphids arrive later in the season. If you spray them out now, they're going to take a lot longer to develop populations that are going to be useful for you when those pest species do arrive later in the season. Uh, and also, pick your insecticides carefully. In the Ice Fine Manual, there is a little table that's quite useful and it just tells you the different insecticide groups what the potential impact that has on beneficials. So you can start to have a look at other options. There's not heaps of soft options, but there are a few, and it is worth um, not just going for the same product again and again. Obviously, for resistance management too, you do want to be thinking about rotating the chemicals. So what can I do later in the season to reduce my risk for next year? And this is something that you can be thinking about now, but really saying, um, whereabouts do I find damage in a field? So when you're going into a field and you see an area that has been uh, damaged by cutworm or has some red legged earth mite issues, what is it around that area that might have um, been supporting those species throughout the summer period? Do I have any areas where I've got weed patches outside the field that might be uh, acting as really good over summer and post for some of these pests? Pastures as well. Um, did I, did I actually graze down my pastures quite late in the previous year or are those pastures actually acting as a, a really good over-summering um, area for some